Um, welcome to Water Street Bookstore. My name is Dan Chartrand. I'm the founder and owner of Water Street Bookstore. And like the Latter-day Saints, the mission of, the, of Water Street Bookstore is to build community around the written word. How's that? Does that work for you? Um, I am so delighted to welcome uh, these two scholars and teachers um, to the store. Um, of course, uh, we're celebrating Laurel's the pu paperback publication of A House of Females, Plural Marriage and Women's Rights in Early Mormonism, 1835 to 1870. And then um, Tom Simpson, who teaches at the Academy, uh, we're also celebrating the paperback publication of American Universities and the Birth of Mormonism, 1867 to 1940. So you have over one century of scholarship <laughs> between these two books. There's 105 years of Mormon history and scholarship in these two books. Uh, and they merge almost seamlessly. Did you plan that? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, it's so great to have you both here tonight for this conversation. Um, Tom Simpson, as I said, uh, Thomas W. Simpson, as I said, teaches at the Academy. He is a specialist in modern U.S. religious history, and his appointment at the Academy is in religion and philosophy. Tom, thank you for agreeing to do this tonight. Please join me in welcoming Tom Simpson and Laurel Hoffman. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, and that this is a, a beautiful gathering place uh, for um, a community like this, and it's such a privilege uh, and an honor of mine to introduce um, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich to you all. Um, really, uh, there's a, a hero uh, to many of us. Um, I heard you say in an interview uh, not too long ago that that. Uh, nobody should really look at you as a model in terms of your career trajectory, but I think a lot of people do <laughs> look at you. As, and we can talk about why you say that. <laughs> but, um, but Laurel uh, is just a revered historian, uh, the winner of the Bank Bancroft Prize, a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, uh, a 300th anniversary uh, professor of history at Harvard, um, graduate of the University of New Hampshire and uh, the Hi. University of Utah and Simmons College, um, and uh, is famous. I have to. I feel it's almost obligatory that um, I have you tell a little bit of a story about the origin of the phrase well-behaved women seldom make history. Uh, Laurel, maybe you've heard that, maybe you've seen it on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker uh, or something, but this is the author of that phrase. It's Women's History Month. Um, you're, you're just a, a major, major figure in the world of women's history and, and for your innovative approaches to that history. But could you tell us the story of the origin of that oh, phrase? Yeah. It's <laughs> double meaning and, you know, there are multiple meanings. Well, that's a good yeah. place to tell that story because I was in New Hampshire at the time mm. and my husband, he was in the back there, was a professor of chemical engineering and I took a seminar in early American history, which which can you uh, all, talk can more you all loudly. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> we do have a mic. Can you hear me way in the back? Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Okay, so anyway, I was um, taking a taking a seminar. Uh, oh, on. All right. Uh, oh. Is that your hand? <laughs> <laughs> I think I just turned it off. Okay. Where? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. If at some point I forget and move away from the mic, and raise your hand, and I'll come back to it. Um, so I was uh, taking a seminar in early American history. And I very much wanted to write uh, something about women, but this was a seminar in colonial history. I was having a really hard time finding any sources. And so in a microfilm collection, I found, I think, over a hundred funeral sermons for Puritan women. <laughs> and I decided, well, what can I learn from reading all this? funeral sermons. And it actually turned out to be the first uh, publication in history um, that I ever had. It ended up in a scholarly journal. And in the introduction to that essay, I said um, they, um, 
you know, went to church even when it snowed, you know, they didn't go to Harvard College, they didn't sit on the deacon's bench, you know, they were obedient, they did what they were told, they didn't ask to be remembered, and they haven't been. Well-behaved women seldom make history. And that was the introduction to that article where I said, but, you know, if scholars pay attention, we can learn something about these anonymous forgotten women. And that has really been the mantra of my work ever since, is to find the people who have been ignored by history, male or female, and to write about them. But 20 years later, a journalist came across the article, which had been anthologized, and I loved that and put it, made an epigraph in her own book on a sort of a popular history of women. And then it went into a book of quotations, and then the internet was born, <laughs> and it went on to the internet. So this slogan has now been used in every possible context. I still get fan mail. <laughs> I still get postings of people seeing it in strange places. But it started out with Puritan women. <laughs> I saw it on uh, Portlandia recently, wearing a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. Um, I wonder if you would if you would um, read for us from the opening of the book. Um, are you able to hold the book and the microphone? Um, yeah, there's this incredible so. story of a women's gathering in uh, in Salt Lake City, and uh, so this this is your first book in Mormon history, yes. right? Which you know, yes. which is your background, your family background, religious that's, thing. That's my family background. I'm a Mormon. I'm a practicing Mormon. I'm a Mormon feminist who, you know, had sometimes not ain't so well behaved at um, <laughs> points in my life. And, um, but it was, it, you know, I, as I moved into my 70s, I thought, oh, it'd be really good to go back and look at that history that I've understood only in a casual and kind of informal way through my um, religious upbringing and look at it through the lens of scholarship. Um, so the book um, begins and ends in 1870 with a very special event. And this is how I introduce that event. Light snow obscured the view of the mountains on January 13, 1870, as masses of Mormon women crowded into the old peaked roof tabernacle in Salt Lake City. The pine benches were hard, the pot-bellied stoves inadequate against the cold. No matter, they would warm themselves with indignation. The news had come by telegraph a week before, the much-feared Colum Bill had passed the United States House of Representatives. If the Senate occurred, concurred, the government would soon have the power to confiscate Mormon property, deprive wives of immunity as witnesses, and imprison their husbands. This wasn't the first time Congress had attempted to outlaw the Mormon marriage system. Calls had begun in the Republican Party platform of 1856, which linked polygamy in Utah and slavery in the South as twin relics of barbarism. And Representative Justin Morrill of Vermont enunciated the essential argument, under the guise of religion, this people has established and seek to maintain and perpetuate a Mohammedan barbar barbarism revolting to the civilized world. Novelists and the new illustrated weeklies took up the chorus linking Utahns not only with southern slaveholders, but with Turks, Africans, and Indians on both sides of the world. They had tried uh, before the Civil War. During the Civil War, they were not able to really attempt to enforce uh, the anti-polygamy laws. But now, with Reconstruction underway in the South, reformers decided to try again, arguing that Utah women were slaves to a system worse than death. They scoffed at that 
sickly sentimentality which proposes to punish nobody, which proposes to hang nobody, which proposes to let all the unchanged passions of the human heart become free to prey upon mankind. What nonsense, Eliza Snow exclaimed from the platform of the own tabernacle. She and other leaders among Salt Lake City women had acted quickly to organize an indignation meeting, a well-known form of popular protest in the 19th century. Indignation was more than anger. It was sympathetic outrage directed at an injustice. And the goal was publicity in its broadest sense. And they got that publicity. The national press, big, big flap, and eventually they brought Susan B. Anthony <coughs> and, and uh, Liz McKady Stanton to Utah the following summer to see what on earth is going on because a few weeks after the indignation meeting, the Utah Territorial Legislature passed the Women's Suffrage Bill, and Utah women actually became the first in the nation to vote. Wyoming had passed the suffrage bill a few weeks before Utah. There were very few settlers in Wyoming at the time, 10 times as many men as women. There were a lot of women in Utah. It had been, um, people had been moving into there from the East Coast in 1847. And so it was a really big deal. And polygamy was such a, uh, an outrage to the reformers in the nation that how could this possibly have happened that uh, Utah had given women the right to vote? So that is the moment in which the book begins. And then the book tries to explain that. How did we get there? How did we get to this moment of Utah women stepping into the national spotlight um, at, at that time, and I go back and look at the lives of the women who created that indignation meeting and take them back to the 1835 and forward and sort of tell their story. Well, this is, uh, this ends up being a, a fascinating history, a cultural history of the early decades of, um, of Mormonism, uh, you know, just for, for people who might not be familiar, um, we're talking about what's now a, a global faith, but in 1830, it was brand new. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, Joseph Smith uh, making claims to being a modern day prophet and, and having access to um, uh, modern scriptures or, or scriptures that could supplement um, the, the traditional Christian canon. Um, and that's a small persecuted group that you know, starts out in the Northeast, starts out in, uh, in upstate New York uh, for the most part, and, and migrates west uh, as a result of um, an interest in, um, in gathering in various places, um, and also as a result of persecution being driven further and further west. You, you say this is in many ways a story of a refugee population. You know, right. people like our. It, it's my. I'm I'm not a practicing Latter Day Saint, um, and. and have ne never been in my lifetime, but my ancestors were. My father grew up in the church, and so Laurel and I share an ancestry in a place in Illinois called Nauvoo, uh, which was a Mormon settlement on the Mississippi, which was one of the largest cities in the United States at the largest time. Largest cities in Illinois, which yeah, is Illinois, still yeah. not very right. Right it's, at the time, yeah. it was larger than time. Chicago, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, right. and and um, but yeah, a really formidable uh, settlement. Um, and so all of my, my, my grandmother Simpson, for instance, all of her uh, great-grandparents lived in Nauvoo, Illinois in the 19th century, and I think all of your great-grandparents uh, lived there as well, is that right, did. some of yours? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, yeah. Uh, yeah. one of the really uh, interesting things to me um, as I researched the book and looked at the women who created the indignation meeting and others who were leaders at the time is how diverse they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a kind of assumption that this religion started in upstate New York and drew a lot from New England, that this was sort of a kind of transplanted 
you know, outgrowth of Puritanism, but they, they came from all of the then known areas of the United States. There were Quakers, there were Shakers, there were Methodists, there were Episcopalians who left their own faith. And it's very extremely important component of Latter-day Saints were converts from Great Britain, from Wales, um, the west of England, uh, southern England, and then later from Scandinavia, uh, northern Europe. But one of one of the women that I, I write about in the book had actually uh, been uh, born in Switzerland, had married someone who was a consul to the Tsar of Russia, um, had uh, ended up going to France where she met Mormons after she was widowed, and then came on the overland trail to Utah. And there was a succession of mob actions against the early Latter-day Saints in Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, where they eventually ended up, uh, you know, I'd, I'd known these stories all my life. And as I began understanding how about 15,000 Latter-day Saints have been expelled from their city of Nauvoo, Illinois, and they ended up over in what is now Omaha, Nebraska, with them Indian territory in what could only be called refugee camps um, under absolutely miserable conditions where they managed to recoup their strength and then begin the great massive migration to the Great Salt Lake Valley in 1847. And they thought they're going to Mexico because that area of the United States was part of Mexico at the time. By the time they got there, the Mexican War had turned it over to the U.S. So it was a great kind of irony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I say, it's such a fascinating story. Um, so it's you have the, the apparent contradictions of you know feminism thriving, not just within what's seen as uh, traditionally a, a patriarchal culture, but thriving within the context of plural marriage yeah. itself, right? Yeah. So, so people, they, they, you know, as you said in the beginning, that this was seen as um, a really regret. This was the opposite of cultural progress right. in the eyes of, of most right. outsiders. That this is this is inherently abusive to women, inherently. Um, non non Christian, yeah. yeah. uh, non Christian, but also non white, yes, non European, yes. Yeah. and one of the things I hadn't understood until I got more deeply into this material is how consistently and throughout Mormons are associated with African Americans, yeah, American yeah, Indians, yeah. Muslims especially, and Jews. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All of those groups had polygamist cultures. And so the distinction between white Europeans and all these other peoples in the world, and this of course goes way back in time to medieval times, an extremely important theme from the 16th century on, is what distinguishes Europeans is monogamy. So Mormons were considered not to be white, not to be Christian, not to be civilized. Now, I need to say what were the rights of women within Mormonism? Uh, and they um, were fascinating. Um, in one chapter, I went to the list of, of complaints made in a resolution at the First National Women's Rights Convention held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850. And they were complaining against the common law which made women subject to their husbands, lost all property rights, and were subordinate to husbands under the common law. They were objecting to laws of divorce that made uh, all the rights in the hands of the husband, including custody of children. They were objecting to lack of access to the professions and to higher education. In Utah, from the very beginning, um, divorce was legal. It was essentially no-fault divorce for women. 
and they used it. <laughs> so one of the things that, and uh, later people said, well, they not only have plurality of marriage, which to them destroyed Christian marriage, but they also allowed divorce. Those two things came together because the fundamental point was free agency and no woman could be forced into accepting a plural marriage. And it was based on a biblical notion that this is what God wanted. Um, it's a, a complicated uh, story and of course uh, women could be browbeaten into a plural marriage, but the idea was consent was very important. And some women did use a divorce in order to leave uh, a marriage. That, that was considered uh, sacred, the right of choice. Um, women were in the professions because the Mormons were so hostile to lawyers and regular physicians that they really validated lay healers and they let anybody plead a case in court. And of course, in a pioneer economy, women have tremendous control over uh, their own uh, uh, productive system, a lot of household production. And in the plural households, this was especially so, uh, where you have uh, several women in the same household engaged in economic activity. So there's a kind of irony here, which observers from the East were surprised to note um, when they came West and began to get um, closer connection. But for many of those Easterners, that was just more evidence of how outrageous the Mormons were and how unladylike Mormon women were. We look at it differently today, but from the lens of 19th century standards of gentility, they seemed uh, really strange. And I guess so much of the texture of this book, like your other books, comes from um, unearthing the, uh, these stories that might have been lost otherwise. And you know, and the, the women in the book, I think, are diverse, as you say. There are lots, and, and there are a lot of um, well, a, a lot of stories of um, resistance and courage and strength, but also real hardship and real um, and frustration. Um, I mean, you tell one story about a woman who's saying, like, "When do I get to go on my, on my mission, mission? Right? When do I get to leave and you know, and then travel for a couple of years? Right? You know." Yeah, <laughs> and, well, and, well, married <laughs> men were not, not married men were often called to go off and preach uh, Mormonism uh, in India, in Hong Kong, in Massachusetts, <laughs> somewhere other than Utah, and the women left behind to run the household. And there's this wonderful letter from uh, a wife of Brigham Young saying, uh, we've decided we're heartily tired of our husbands, and we would like to be called on missions. <laughs> so, so we can go off and do that. I should clarify here, when we talk about the term Mormons use is plural marriage. Um, it, it, it's literally uh, polygyny, which is a term meaning more than one wife. Um, the high point proportionally of um, polygamous practice came uh, roughly 1860. There were still lots of polygamists as late as 1900, but proportion to the total population of the church, the high point was about 1860 and it was about 43% of all individuals in the territory of Utah, men, women, and children, um, lived in plural households. But 60% of those households had only two wives. And another maybe 20% might have three. Brigham Young's 27 wives is just off the charts, and many of those women had no kind of 
conjugal relationship with him, but lived in the collective household of Brigham Young. Uh, and they were a range of ages, although he did have children from many of those, uh, from many women, and I've forgotten right, right this minute what the exact number was, eight or, eight or nine. So Brigham Young was what everybody wrote about. But the common plural household was pretty small. Um, and later, as the system canonized and developed and you get into a second generation, there are interesting relationships sometimes. A man, uh, the men who were likely to have plural wives in all societies, as in Mormonism, were those who were the most prosperous or in leadership positions. You know, that's how it happens. You capitalize on all those smart women and all their labor <laughs> and their progeny, which is the big deal to have a lot of sons and daughters. And that sometimes a man would have a wife in Salt Lake City and one 300 miles south in St. George. Um, you know, not a girl in every port, but <laughs> almost, you know, if you were an important man and you traveled a lot. And that was the case for Brigham Young in particular. He did have a wife who managed his household in the summer headquarters of St. George and other wives in Salt Lake City. Um, and, you know, in terms of the women's stories, I think uh, one of the ways that you've revolutionized the study of history and the, the writing of history is to look in really creative ways at source material and to think in new ways about source material. So could you talk a little bit about the sources that allowed you to unearth these yeah. stories? A lot of writing uh, about women, and in Mormonism in particular, is based on memoirs, people recalling their childhood, recalling their past. I decided to go in another direction because those memoirs are so controversial within Mormonism. They're constantly trying to, because the practice was ended somewhat violently by the federal government and some, some of it was underground. You know, the memoirs can't always be trusted. They're constantly having to explain something. Um, and so I relied um, exclusively, really, for the major source material on day-by-day -day accounts that are describing things very close to when they happened. And I used men's diaries as well as women's diaries diaries, letters, account books, autograph books, um, stories um, that were printed um, in the newspaper. And it's not that these sources were less biased. I mean, all sources have bias, as you as students know. But people writing about something as it happens don't know how it's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. And they can't look back and sort of re revisit it. And so I was able to get um, not great expansive evidence, but lots of small bits of emphasis that helped me understand how it looked as it was becoming a system. And that was important. And then I used some other sources. A very important source for the book was a quilt. It was made by 63 women um, and by understanding the symbolism and the context and the women themselves involved, I was able to understand their response to the coming of the um, National Army in 1857 in what has come to be known as the Utah War. And I used um, embroideries and um, um, things that people made, you know, little t paper tokens and cards. Anything that emerged in the moment of the events, I was trying to understand. Mm, great. And can
can you just say a little bit as a, as a follow-up about, um, you know, you said uh, we have far more men's diaries than women's, and just what kinds of ways that they were able to record their thoughts? Yeah. And, um, yes. Um, this is generally true, um, that more sources from men survive in the world. <laughs> you know, go back to my Puritan funeral sermons, I have nothing in the hand of a woman when I did my first book. I had to tease it out, sometimes out of court records where you'd get some oral testimony in early New England. But um, in, in uh, Mormonism, it was a religious duty for men to go on missions and proselyte and strongly encouraged to keep diaries of those missions. So that it exaggerated, um, it, you know, even ordinary men began to keep diaries. They didn't always continue when they returned from their missions, but there are just a lot of men's diaries. The women's diaries, uh, the earliest ones um, have some poetry and some letters before 1842. But most of the women's diaries that I was able to use emerged after the organization of the Female Relief Society, which is the women's organization of the church. And the minutes of those early meetings survive. And they became a very important source. But I think there was a kind of consciousness raising. There were also expanding populations, so you have more potential diarists. But something was really going on in Nauvoo, Illinois in 1842. And so I was able, when I told about the murder of the prophet Joseph Smith in 1844, I actually was able to draw upon several diaries and letters kept by women. And then that continues until the 18. 60s, and there appears to have been a paper shortage. Um, and, you know, we find people writing on the back of old, old school maps, a school teacher trying to write things down. These little diaries that the women kept were often made of homemade paper like you made in elementary school. But what's interesting, they were stitched together sometimes with what I could identify as homespun linen thread. And you say sometimes just women's work kept women from writing, yes. right? Yes. You know, as you said, sometimes there were diary entries that just said spun. Spun. Right. That's, <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I did. And uh, yeah, yeah, so so there were there were a lot of just uh, there was just yeah. a lot of work to be done. Right. And uh, something that's that really struck me uh, at first that I realized I had misread the title in many ways right from the start is I, yeah. that there's a really there's a multiple there a layered meaning of the word house here that's connected to women's work and women's community and women's authority I think in any ways connected right. to you're talking about the relief society that was a, a sphere of women's work right. and so there's there's something really powerful in the story about the ways that early Mormon women exercised religious authority and felt they had access to religious authority, and as we speak, it's still contra a controversial question about whether women should have priesthood authority yes. in Mormonism. And so do you see the book as having implications for kind of current discussions about religious authority in Mormonism and women's authority in the church? And um, Yes, ab absolutely, it has current implications. See, I'm, this is not original to me. Um, the, these, uh, um, the discovery of um, the extensive kind of re religious authority exercised by women in the pioneer period and actually quite a bit beyond that as well. If we have to think about this as a world of separate spheres, mm -hmm. as a, a kind of um, uh, binary division between male and female. Um, the highest um, order of priesthood 
in Mormonism is marriage, which occurs in a Mormon temple. And you cannot be saved if you're a man without a woman, and a woman can't be saved without a man. So Mormons, in, in ways that are really foreign to many other Christian communities, really, they go beyond sacralizing Mormons, sacralizing marriage. I mean, marriage is really the epitome. Um, and in this era, it could be plural. But the women are married to each other, as well as to the man. And it's a world in which a lot of work was divided, uh, male-female work, in the larger society as well as in Mormonism. And it was certainly a world that, because they're in a frontier environment, perpetuated the division of labor in medicine, where a lot of the healing and virtually all of the management of childbirth is in the hands of women. And so women healed with herbs, like Martha Ballard, um, my uh, earlier book, but they also healed by the laying on of hands. And they used um, oil to perform blessings, not only for other women, but those who had um, been married in the temple, in this higher order of marriage, um, joined prayer circles with the husbands. There are really interesting examples, for example, of a Mormon apostle, one of the highest male authorities in the church is dying. And the other apostles and their wives come around his bed and officiate in, in these prayers and in these rituals. Women um, presided in their own meetings in the Relief Society. There's a long story. Part of the story of the book is how they went from a sense of empowerment in Nauvoo to a kind of official disempowerment because of the conflict between Joseph Smith's wife, Emma, and Brigham Young. Emma Smith did not go west. She had been the president of the Female Relief Society, and Brigham decided there wasn't going to be any more Relief Society. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting story how the women who were leaders in the community perpetuated their gatherings for testifying and for praying and blessing one another under circumstances that were not as formalized as they had been in Nauvoo, and eventually became formalized. And by the time they became formalized again, um, they were ready to um, be uh, really take hold in the economy. So they began to build their own meeting houses, relief society houses, that there were meeting houses, endowment houses, school houses, you know, lots of different places for gathering in early Mormonism. But Relief Society halls were built. And on the lower level, they were stores where women could sell and exchange the materials that they had um, created. And on the upper level, they held meetings of many kinds. There are, there are associations of midwives. There uh, are gatherings of males and female women. This is um, heterosexual uh, meetings for uplift, <laughs> poetry and reading and reading compositions. I mean, they're joiners. Mormons are absolutely <laughs> joiners. And there were lots of these meetings. And then eventually, the Women's Exponent, which opened in 1872, the longest lived women's suffrage newspaper in the United States, which went from 1872 to 1912. Mm. Well, and that's, uh, that's where my book 
picks up. I think we, we, one of the commonalities we have and one of the common interests we have and one of the common joys we have is <clears throat> of discovering this newspaper, The Woman's Exponent. There's really nothing like it in the United States in the 19th century with um, women involved with polygamy and advocating for suffrage. And, um, and, and in, in my story, I see that they're just absolutely pivotal in terms of repairing relationships between Mormonism and the United States. And, uh, um, and seeing, uh, I, I argue that American universities were the only space, the only cultural and institutional space that offered Mormons hospitality and allowed for a kind of um, uh, reconciliation, I would say, between Mormons and, uh, and U.S. Uh, culture. Um, it's a place where Mormons could imagine themselves being part of the American project. Um, I want to ask you one more question before, and then open it up to, to folks in the audience uh, who've been so lovely. Um, you know, uh, we're um, th thinking about, uh, th th there's so many ways in which um, this is uh, a remote past but I, I, it seems like there might be some some implications and some lessons for you know for women who are um, who are part of the resistance today, who are you know part of the Me Too movement, part of you know looking for ways to agitate and resist and have solidarity and have community. Um, do you, do you see lessons or implications in these stories for for especially younger women who might be looking for ways to um, to make their mark on society and change larger structures? Uh, well, I mean, it's a, it's a different world, um, totally different world, as I said. It's part of a larger world where um, so much is divided by gender. But what I do see is when people are organized around a common goal, that's what's so fascinating about this women can vote, is that the men in this community realized we need each other. And that was very true in the economy in Utah as well. And when you're working toward a very common objective, there's a way in which women can contribute. But one of the things I realized, um, I shouldn't have been surprised at this, because I discovered the woman's exponent uh, with my fellow uh, Mormon feminists in 1972. It's a long time ago. And we very much uh, really kind of romanticized those women. I mean, these were women who were going off to, some of them, off to medical school, for example. Um, and doing things that in the 1950s, as I was growing up, we didn't see women doing. Um, the 1950s and 60s um, in, in Mormonism seemed very bland compared to the 1850s and 60s. Not that any of us wanted polygamy, but we were really fascinated with the independence and the publishing, mm -hmm. and the writing, um, and the economic uh, versatility of women. So I do think that we have a tendency, and I don't know whether the young women in the front here have that tendency to think um, change only goes one way, mm -hmm. things get better, and it's really good to hope things are gonna <laughs> get better, and that you're going to play a part in it, but one of the things you have to understand is change goes like this. And when people decide it's all solved, that's usually when things start to slide. So I think there really is a good story because they were up in Nauvoo, they went down in the early years in Salt Lake, they came up again. And the story after that is a complicated one. I'm just reading a manuscript right now. Someone who's written a long, longitudinal study starting with the 19th century and coming up to the present. And yes, for Mormon women, for women in the United States in general, uh, it's a continual ongoing process of learning how to band together around the areas where 
gender matters and to work cooperatively where it doesn't. Thank you so much. Will you all join me in? Do we have time for a question or two from the sure, audience? I think so. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, I noticed in the section that you read, you you used so many details, you know, a light snow was falling and the benches were hard, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little to how you use your imagination as a historian. I mean, you have the sources, but obviously there's a lot that's not in there, so how do you sort of find yeah, yourself I using your imagination? Yeah, I didn't make that up. Really? <laughs> that was all, wow, so not that, that's, the, that's the advantage of the diaries. It was snowing today, <laughs> and yet we're still going to come. And uh, the benches, um, yeah, I've sat on some of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, but absolutely you use your imagination, absolutely. But um, most of us try really hard not to, if we're, if we're writing. That's what's so lovely about people who write about their own daily minutia. The minutia really turns out to be really interesting sometimes. Yeah. What happened uh, when plural marriages were banned in the federal government? What happened to the families? And were yes. women Boy. happy or were they, were they glad? Or so the question is what happens when plural marriage was banned? Were women happy? Were they glad? What happened to the families? Um, every, it needs a, a, its own book. <laughs> There's been a lot uh, written on this. Um, uh, some were just totally um, devastated, not because maybe they loved plural marriage, but because they had sacrificed so much mm -hmm. doing something that they considered God-given, that God wanted them to do. And then to have the church say, okay, we give up which is what eventually happened. The federal government was confiscating church property. It was doing all of those things that they threatened in the 1870s. They were doing it by the end of the 1880s. There was intense um, prosecution, and you could also call it persecution. It was very, very hard. And Wilford Woodruff, who's a major character in this book, actually, because he's a wonderful diarist, was president of the church at that time, and he said, I've been forced to do something to save the church as an institution, because it was really going to be destroyed. So it was very, very hard. Some people moved to Mexico or Canada in order to preserve their marriages. The rule was they weren't going to perform any more marriages. It was a little iffy about whether they could continue to live with the plural wives that they had. Probably not supposed to, but many did. And by this period, because of that period of intense um, pressure from the government, a lot of women had been sort of living separately anyway almost in hiding. So they just could come out of hiding. And I think the idea was that the men were to continue to offer support to all of their families. And I think many tried to do, but in truth, the women were adding a lot of that support anyway. So it was difficult. Some people refused. Um, and there are today, there are maybe 30, 30 to 50,000 um, people who claim descent, if not literal, at least um, um, spiritually from early Mormon polygamists, that um, it's a, still an issue in Canada and the U.S. as well. Yes? Uh, 
I'm, I'm really excited. I can't wait to read the book. It's, it's, I'm really, it sounds wonderful. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, wise relationships with one another. Mm -hmm. yes. Do they tend to be harmonious? I mean, it's, uh, or, uh, well, if you read the memoirs, it was very harmonious. <laughs> yeah, um, diary is still a difference. Yeah, the diaries, I mean, obviously, there are going to be tensions. Um, but there was, this was, it's really important to emphasize this was a religious commitment. And so you get people feeling really bad that they're angry <laughs> at their sister wife. And a divorce sometimes. And one of my favorite documents was um, two women writing to Brigham Young to ask to be divorced from their husband and they planned to look, continue to live together. <laughs> so there were those cases uh, where the relationships were very close. There were powerful communal relationships among women, but they often crossed household lines, which is what intrigued me. Some of the closest relationships that show up in diaries, and that may be because you don't need to comment on something that's every day, but some of the closest relationships were among women who were neighbors or friends and would meet in each other's houses. So lots of female closeness, but maybe some tension about sharing a husband and uh, 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 the household resources, mm -hmm. especially younger older women seeing their husband marrying mm -hmm. younger women. Mm -hmm. And just a, just a quick story along those lines from my own research that, that was incredible was, uh, I, I think I knew I had a story when I found uh, the diary, it was actually one of the published diaries that I used, one of the few published diaries, um, but of Ellis Reynolds Ship, yes. who was, uh, who, who went to the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia in the 1870s. She left Salt Lake, went 2,000 miles east to get her medical degree, her MD, uh, while um, her sister wives took care of things, including her children back home. And then when she came back with her MD, another sister got to go and get, and get her MD. From, you know, and, but then there's all this tension in the, in the relationships too, because Ellis, uh, you know, her, her husband will go off to a, a mission and she'll say, okay, you know, here we go again. And, um, you know, and, I, and she'll pray that he'll be comforted while he's on his mission. And then, you know, he comes back with another wife. Or something, you know? and, and, you know, and so she's, she's just racked with jealousy at times. And then, you know, there are these incredible stories of her being down to, I think, literally her last dollar um, at medical school. And she's in despair that she's going to have to go home. And then all of a sudden money shows up from one of the sister wives, you know, and especially one that she hadn't been close, very close with. And, and so it's just, it's full of this kind of texture and complexity and, uh, and just and humanity that comes through in the diaries that again, I think that because there's not a desire to um, what add varnish or, or romanticize, it's just, it's really an authentic reporting of, of daily life. Okay. I can't hear. Sue shouted out. Sure. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I don't remember reading this in the book, but did you take all the way? Did I miss it? That did you track women's power structures? Like the first wife got to be more powerful, like in Annie Park Tanner's diary, or was the younger wives more powerful because the husbands took them off to lead the missions, or? I mean, did you track that, or have you no, that? Uh, no, lots of people have kind of worked on that kind of material. It's there in some of the diaries. Um, the most explicit in the sources I used are the diaries of um, uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen Spencer, trying to remember her last name, who writes to her friend, who's also Ellen, in California. And she says, I, I never felt I would be jealous if Hiram got a dozen wives. 
but I, I really can't handle the way he, he's so happy with his new wife. And it's a, it's a very, very revealing. I mean, there's, there's so much of this culture of sacrifice for the good of all that has, is so inculcated and this is the 19th century pattern. You read 19th century novels, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and she's just very explicit. And her friend, of course, says, oh, I'm not going to do that. So different personalities responded in different ways. The first wife, the other place I talk about it, is with Augusta Cobb, who's a plural wife of Brigham Young, who writes him these incredibly satirical, constant letters complaining. <laughs> and I analyze Augusta's problem is that she hasn't figured out that he has no control over who gets a new wash tub or who gets a new dress. It's Mary Ann, his first wife. And the, you know, the first wife becomes the manager of the household, and the women who are happy in that learn how to work in a cooperative relationship with other women. And I think probably first wives had a lot of the, I mean, these men are doing day-to-day -day management. If you get a new bonnet, you've probably got to work with Mary Ann. And also, if you want your husband, your sister, to be called on a mission when you go to the South Pacific to join your husband, you ask Mary Ann. I mean, it becomes a really interesting, the power relationship of those first wives, particularly those women like Phoebe Woodruff. Some of the most powerful women in the indignation meeting are these first wives who have been only wives. Mm. Mm. And they become a very strong leadership cohort in this whole system. Mm -hmm. Do we have maybe maybe one more and then you can sign some books and talk mm -hmm. to people? Okay. Is there any, any others? I'm curious about your research. Mm. Was it mostly in Utah? Mm. And, and how many years did you work on it? I, pretty close to 10 years <clears throat> from the beginning until the publication of the hard cover, which was a year ago. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Utah um, where there are, as you can imagine, more of these sources, but the church historical department where many of these documents reside is a state-of-the-art historical facility now. If anything has been microfilmed, which nearly everything in Mormonism has been microfilmed, if you know about family search and some of those things. Anything has been microfilmed for $20, you can have a copy. If it's one page or 200 pages, maybe the fee has gone up, it was 20 <laughs> the last I looked. Um, not always easy to read, but, but you can. So I spent a lot of time with the primary documents, the actual physical artifacts, because the physicality was part of the evidence for me. But I used these digital copies as well. And a lot of diaries, as you pointed out, Ellis Ship's family, her diary was published a number of years ago, and some, there are a lot of editions of diaries. So I used both. Thanks again. Well, okay. uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Laurel is, uh, has generously offered to uh, sign copies of the book if you're interested. So plenty, plenty of copies uh, are available here. Thank you so much for coming and enjoying this evening with us.